Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Wands World and as I suspected <laughs> when I gave my closing remarks on Friday and you might have suspected also I'm not going to be doing any cooking today. I've been very busy with my writing and cooking has had to move to the back burner as it were. <laughs> Uh, but it does lead me very, very gently into today's topic because uh, I have a Zoom meeting with some very old friends of mine uh, since my university days, which is going back 50 years now. I have a Zoom meeting with them every Thursday morning, which is Wednesday evening for them. And we're a group of Morris dancers and once a year we have a big dinner called a feast in October and I used to attend it regularly even when I lived in the United States I'd fly to England to attend haven't attended at all for the last 10 years um, for one reason or another but they're doing it virtually this year so I'm going to be part of the virtual feast and it involves cooking <laughs> or at least it involves eating uh, we usually have the feast at uh, a restaurant uh, of some sort or another and somebody else does the cook so for the virtual feast we have to do the cooking ourselves and of course some of the people are not really that capable of doing that some of them are most of them are probably i certainly am but it's going to be two o'clock in the morning when it starts for me so i'm not going to be doing it and i wondered then what i am going to be doing and somehow by you know twisted uh, root of logic I was led to the question of self-reliance like how, how do we rely on ourselves for things like getting food um, getting to work or maybe we don't rely on ourselves to get to work maybe we drive ourselves maybe we take a train and so on so it just just started percolating and I was thinking that in what areas am I self-reliant? If I'm going to go on a Zoom meeting when everyone's eating, have I got enough ability to cook for myself and prepare all the things necessary? Well, I do. But then I got to thinking about Rolf Waldo Emerson's classic essay, Self-Reliance. And that's ultimately where I want to get to. What is the importance in our lives of being self-reliant? And what are the areas that are most important? Let's start down that path. Now, one of the ways I started thinking about this was thinking about my own childhood. Because I was, th I mean, I always think about these things now and again. I think about people going completely nuts because they've lost their smartphone or left it at home or it's not working or the power's gone out, you know, during the winter in some parts of um, Britain and the United States I have storms and a power line will come down and people will be without power and so what are they going to do? 
because then they don't have perhaps cooking, perhaps they don't have refrigeration, um, certainly don't have the internet, um, can't uh, recharge the batteries in their phones and their laptops and so forth. So we are reliant on a great number of things and as time passes we get reliant on more and more. So when I was a young boy my family didn't have a car, we didn't have a telephone, uh, we didn't have a television. In fact in South Australia when we first moved there there wasn't any television. That was in 1958. Uh, I think it came a couple of years later, but at the outset there was no television. Most people didn't have telephones. And so on. And somehow <laughs> we survived. <laughs> now it's interesting to look back on those days and to think about what it was that we did um, when we weren't occupied with work or school. I mean obviously I went to school five days a week, uh, I had homework uh, most of the day, it was taken up either with being in school, um, doing my homework and eating. <laughs> we had a radio and there was plenty to occupy us. There was a ch several children's programs on uh, when we got home from school. And I listened to them all intently. And then there were radio dramas and I would listen to them too. And between them, homework, and dinner, there was enough to do on the weekend. On Sundays we went to church. Um, I used to go to Sunday school first at one church and then I used to go to another church for services with my parents. We have Sunday dinner. <sighs> then in the afternoon, same as we did on Saturday, like out on the street <laughs> and just hanging out with the other kids, doing all kinds of stupid things. Um, whatever we could make up you know, either formal games, which were mostly um, the province of girls, actually. The boys mostly just kind of roughhoused about and uh, did various odds and ends. And somehow or other, life was okay. <laughs> uh, once a week, we would go to the pictures. They changed the, the film that they showed once a week. So usually it was Tuesday night, I think, we would go and they had a cartoon, a newsreel, um, uh, sometimes a B movie, and then the main movie. Um, also, incidentally, I used to go on Saturday afternoons, they used to have a children's matinee. So, uh, you know, somehow the days went, <laughs> somehow we managed. Now the more things you add, the more things you miss if they're not there. I remember when we first got our television and it changed everything. Our living room which had been in a kind of circular formation of chairs so that people could all sit round, all of a sudden was focused on the television. And our evening was dictated by what was on the television. And my mother used to prepare dinner, but she used to prepare it in such a way that we could eat before the news so that we could be finished and sit down and watch the news, or at least they watched the news. I, I didn't really care, I didn't really understand it. And then we used to have a magazine that came every week with the shows listed in it. And you could look through it and you could say, okay, on Thursday night, 
this movie is coming on, I want to see this, this episode of this um, drama is, is ha you know, and so on. So your whole world could be um, like scheduled by what was on the television. Even Saturday mornings, I stopped wandering around with my friends because Saturday mornings were devoted to westerns and I liked them. <laughs> so I would just turn, you know, have breakfast, go and turn on the television, watch westerns for the morning. It changed, it changed my life. The, te the technology w changed the way I thought about things. And that's really Emerson's point, is that when you adopt a technology, it has its advantages, but it also prevents you from seeing your own capabilities in that direction. Now his point, which was you know, a long time ago, was that when people started navigating according to the compass and according to well-established uh, navigational tools like the astrolabe and so forth, people stopped looking at the stars because they didn't need to know the stars to navigate anymore. And I also, I mean, I have that kind of mentality myself too, is that, that it, it feels to me a loss not to be able to navigate my way around the night sky. And in fact, I, I do know a, a lot about the night sky because I took the trouble to learn it, but, but I don't need it. And <laughs> right now, I mean, for many years now, I've lived in big cities where the light pollution is so bad, they can't see the, the stars. When I lived out, way out in the country, in the, in the mountains in New York, I could see the night sky very clearly a lot of the time. And I was very happy to know like, where Orion is, where Ursa Major is, where Sirius, my favorite binary star, and so forth. All quirky, I guess. But I, but I had to drive myself to learn that because there's no need. And with the invention of personal computers, smartphones, the internet, and so forth, we have become more and more dependent on those technologies and therefore less self-reliant. Now, I'm not going to be like a lot of people and say, oh, well, it's, a, it's a terrible shame that, that, that these things have happened, that, that society has changed, that people are using social media in ways that are not productive, but I'm not going to do any of that. But I am going to look at the ability to be self-reliant in the face of those technologies. Now, I very clearly remember the summer of 19. 82. I was living on my campus at the time and a lot of my colleagues were buying personal computers and at that time I didn't have the money to buy one but I wasn't sure if I had the desire for one. I wrote a lot and I wrote on yellow pads with a pencil. I would write everything down in longhand and edit everything and then I would get out my electric typewriter <laughs> and type it up and mail it off to a journal. Um, and that's how I did all of my research writing. And this summer I had a couple of papers I wanted to write. And I said, okay, I'm going to decide if this is the most efficient way of writing a paper, 
or whether I would be better off with a personal computer. Now I'm not sure how, <laughs> how that was going to exactly work, but I, I mean there were some personal computers in um, the library at my university that I could play around with. And so I could, you know, I could write a little bit on them and I could also write on the yellow pad. And my conclusion <laughs> at the end of the summer was that the yellow pad was not superior to word processors, but it, but it was about equal. Didn't, you know, didn't really make a lot of difference. Well, that was in the days when word processors were really, really basic. I mean, the one I had, which was Word Star, did have Word Wraparound. And that's when you got to the end of a line. It did, it did automatically start a new line. Um, but the first one that I used, I didn't. You had to hit the return just like you would on a, a manual typewriter. And it didn't have spell check. It didn't have a lot of things. It was just basically um, a fancy typewriter. And, I, you know, except that it stored it and what you could correct um, on the computer and then print out a perfect copy with no white out <laughs> or what kind of um, system you had for um, correcting mistakes. And I thought, no, no, I won't buy a computer. Um, the, the yellow pad is just as good. Well, then that year, um, Radio Shack came out with a, with a model, uh, the Tandy 1000, that was superior to the IBM PC and a lot cheaper. The IBM PC, when, when it first came out, retail was around $5,000. Can you imagine? Like $5,000. <laughs> I can't even imagine spending $5,000 in today's dollars on computer technology, let alone back then. $5,000 at that point was about a third of my before tax salary. I mean, I just couldn't afford that. But the Tandy 1000 was $1,000 and they offered credit, store credit, so I didn't have to put a lot of money down. And it had a 16 color monitor and all kinds of other bells and whistles that were really quite delightful. So sunk my money down and of course have never looked back because these days writing on a computer is just infinitely superior to pencil and paper because I've got the internet at my disposal, I've got all kinds of tools that I can use and so on. So I would never go back. But I can, I have the ability, I do know how to do it. Uh, Portable phones of various sorts, mobile phones, cell phones, smartphone. I've taken a long time to add them to my personal inventory. For a long time I didn't want any kind of mobile phone at all uh, because I knew that as soon as I had one people would be able to contact me uh, all the time. And even back then, now we're talking about the 90s, but in those days, I routinely used to unplug my phone because I didn't want to be disturbed. Um, you know, somebody at work would want to call me about a committee or an overdue paper or hiring or something like that. And it, it meant that if I answered the phone 24-7, people would be calling me 24-7. <laughs> so I got in the habit of either unplugging my phone or actually I bought a, um, an answering machine and I would just screen my calls. People would call, would go to the answering machine and if it would work, I didn't bother. I'd just uh, leave a message. I'll get back to you 
when I feel like it. But when you've got a phone in your pocket and people know you've got the phone in your pocket, then you're even more trapped. Same with email as it happens. It's like your students feel like, okay, I've got your email and I've got this problem with the paper, so I will write to you right now and you can answer me right now as if everything's desperately urgent. So I just, I, I resisted getting a cell phone for a very long time, but I did, my, um, my wife, persuaded me to get one because our son has um, various uh, problems having to do with um, insect bites. Um, he can go into anaphylactic shock and we walked in the woods a lot and she, she persuaded me saying, oh, uh, you know, if, you get, if he gets bitten and you're way out in the, in the woods, then uh, how are you going to call for help? Blah, blah, blah. Never mind the fact that when we're way out in the woods, we don't have any, any cell coverage. But I succumbed, and since then, I've gone through various upgrades, and so now I have a fairly up-to-date, well, it's two years old, Android smartphone, which I mostly don't use, except for WeChat. I've got some friends on WeChat, WhatsApp, various ways of keeping in contact with people, but I don't, I wouldn't say that I use them more than four or five times a week. And then I use the GPS when I'm abroad uh, in a foreign city because I'm hopeless uh, at finding my way around. And I like to walk around a lot. And so I'll go out of my hotel and I'll go wandering, wandering, thinking I know what I'm doing and then find out I have no idea. And you know, so all of those things are useful. I don't have a television. When I moved into my apartment, uh, there wasn't a washing machine here, and, but there also wasn't a television. And, but the owner had said, well, I'm going to put a television in. And I said, I don't want a television, but I want a washing machine. He said, OK, fine. So that was the trade-off. And I'm, I'm happy with that. I've, I've got um, a laptop, of course, and I, I do my writing on my laptop. Now, the, the overarching question, or overdetermined question, perhaps, is can I do without these things that I have? Can I do without the internet? Can I do without my smartphone? And the answer is yes, I can. I would find it very, very difficult to go back to pen and paper for writing an essay. And I'm not going to do that. Like if I lose electricity for a long period of time such that I can't use my laptop, I'm not going to go with paper and pencil because I'm going to have to uh, type it up anyway. I'm a, what, what I will do is I'll write myself a lot of notes so that I'm ready to get back to it. Um, but yeah, I have moved to a space now where it's difficult for me to move back. It's the, the self-reliance is fading <laughs> or slipping, uh, granted. And the counterbalance that loss of self-reliance, I don't have a car anymore. I either walk or ride my bicycle, for the most part, unless I have to do something extraordinary like move house, then I need help with a truck. I, I cook for myself almost every day of the year, uh, which means I shop for myself. Um, I don't plan <laughs> my meals, but I but I, I work very closely with the markets to, to get what I, what I feel um, I need or would like. Um, so in some parts of my life, I have shared the technology that other people rely on. I, I've, got, I've got a number of friends, not, not here in Cambodia, but in, in other parts uh, of the world 
who live alone like I do don't know how to cook or don't want to cook. And I have a lot of friends in New York who don't want to cook. They, they, they have delivery every night. I know people in Italy who go out to eat every day. Um, people who don't ever exercise. <laughs> that, that, that is, they have to make an effort you know, to have a gym membership or something like that. I don't need a gym membership because I ride a bicycle and I walk. So there's, there are trade-offs. I've, I've traded some of my self-reliance for technology, but in other areas in my life, I've traded down from technology to self-reliance. And I guess that's about where I imagine we can all be is to have a balance and I guess my question to you is what is your balance in what areas are you self-reliant and in what areas do you rely on technology and could you change it and would <laughs> this is the most important point would your life be better if you were more self-reliant? And there's no real way to find out except to do it. <laughs> but of course, the transition, as I've said in other videos, the transition, the change, maybe one that you think, ah, well, that would be good. You know, I would, I would be healthier. Uh, maybe I'd lose weight or, you know, whatever. You know, like the, there may be advantages. And yet we still find ourselves not being able to do it. Why don't we want to be self-reliant? <laughs> now, that's a question I'll continue with. Um, not necessarily on Friday, but I'll continue with it. And meanwhile, tell your friends about my videos. Like and subscribe. And I will see you on Friday.